Florence Chadwick was born in 1918 in San Diego, California, and by the age of 10, she was known as an excellent competitive swimmer. In fact, at that age, she decided that she preferred swimming in the ocean for competitions over swimming in a regular swimming pool like most competition swimmers do. And uh, she became the first woman in history to swim the English Channel in both directions, from England to France and from France to England. And uh, in 1952, July 1952, she decided she wanted to take on a new challenge, a bigger challenge, and that was to swim 26 miles in the ocean near her home, San Diego. She wanted to swim from Catalina Island to the California coast right off San Diego, a 26 mile swim. And she started out, she had boats on both sides of her for people to be there to protect her from sharks that would come along as she was swimming. So from time to time, you would hear the, the shotgun blast as they were scaring away the sharks. And, um, and she had her coach in one of the boats. She had her mother in one of the boats to give her that uh, inspiration and encouragement as she was doing the swim. After 14 hours of swimming, she turned to her mother and said, Mom, I, I don't think I can do it anymore. And her mother said, Please, darling, you got to keep going. You've gone so far. Try to do it. But an hour later, after 15 hours of swimming, she called it quits. Called it quits. And she said that the reason was because that a fog had set in over her as she was swimming. And it was so dense, so thick, that she could not see very far in front of her. And the main thing she couldn't see was the finish line, the California coast. After she got out of the water and they went to the coastline, she learned that she was less than a mile from the coast when she quit trying. So two months later, she went back and did it. She swam from Catalina Island the full 26 miles all the way to the California coast. And this time she also had the fog set in on her and it obscured her vision of the coastline, the finish line. She said, but the thing that kept her going was that she memorized the California coast. And every time that she couldn't see it, she would envision it in her mind. And that vision of her goal is what kept her going. Now, all of us, not just in America, but uh, you know, I'm talking to you from New Orleans, but, but all of us in America and around the world are faced with a fog that is obscuring our vision right now. It's called COVID-19 or the coronavirus. And I call it a Goliath a giant. Now you may say, well, Mark, you can't call it a, a, a Goliath because Goliath was, you know, bigger than any other person alive. And, and the coronavirus is so tiny, you can't even see it with the human eye unless you use a microscope. That's true. But it's still a Goliath. Why? Because Goliath's main job, the reason the Philistines sent him out twice a day to talk to the Israeli army was so that he could intimidate them and keep them in their place, to keep them from moving forward and getting victory. He was there to intimidate them into fear and panic so that they felt like there was no other option but to sit there and feel less than men, less than warriors, less 
than conquerors. I've said many times that, you know, I can go through anything if I know two things about it. And that is, number one, that it won't last forever. They'll come to an end. Some point, it, it'll end. And number two, that the end result will be worth more than what I had to go through to get there. And I believe that eventually we will see both of those things come to pass. I believe we will have a vaccine. We will have medications that can kill this virus. It will come. I've been shocked to see the, the different pharmaceutical companies coming together. As far as I know, this is the first time. There may have been, a, been other times I'm not aware of, but to my knowledge, it's the first time that I know of that all pharmaceutical companies are coming together, sharing all of their information with each other so they can all join hands and find a cure to save us from this virus. And I want to talk to you particularly to Americans right now. And those of you from other countries, forgive me for focusing on my own country, but I, I want to talk to my own countrymen about what we've been through so far and how we've survived. Because sometimes you face something like this and you get so overwhelmed by what you see that you basically forget what you've already been through and how much you've already survived. You forget all the things that you've conquered so far. And I was doing some studying, and forgive me for looking at my notes, but without my notes, I'm not going to remember all these statistics, okay? Because there's too many numbers in here, all right? But the Revolutionary War, which occurred from 1775 to 1783, there were 6,800 Americans killed in the Revolutionary War. Then we go to the Civil War. 620,000 Americans died. Let's look at World War I. There were 116,708 Americans. You could basically say 117,000 Americans killed. And the Spanish flu killed 675,000 Americans. But now let's talk about the world population. The Spanish flu around the world from January 1918 to December 1920, that flu infected over 500 million people. That's over half a billion people. And over 50 million people around the world died from the Spanish flu. And 675,000 of them were Americans. But we've survived these things. All these calamities have happened around the world and we're still kicking. We're still here. Yes, things happen to us, but we're still here. One of my favorite verses about the nation of Israel in the book of Exodus, says this, and the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. I think we can agree that there's probably never been any people group that has been more attacked and harmed and killed and persecuted than the nation of Israel, than the Jewish people. But the Bible says the more they afflicted them. This is talking about when they were in Egypt. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And that's the attitude you and I need to have. Is that yes, we've been through all these things, but we've been what? Through them. We don't look at them as the finish line. Some people are looking at the coronavirus, COVID-19, thinking it's the finish line. No, it's not the finish line. You need to look beyond this and envision what it's going to be like when we get to the coastline, when we cross the finish line. 
You need to envision this thing being over. And not only that we will be able to say, I survived it, but we can say, I'm stronger for it. As a nation, we're more unified because of it. And as a world, we came together to solve a crisis together in unity. We can use these oppositions, these obstacles, these crises, either as excuses to give up or as reasons to press on and press through and find solutions for our world. Another thing we've been through, World War II started in September of 1939 and ended in September 1945. And in World War II, there were 420,000 American deaths. That's a lot. World War II was known as the bloodiest war in history. Now that's saying a lot with all the wars that have been throughout history, but it said that it, it was the bloodiest war in history. 3% of the world's population died in World War II. 3% of the whole population of the world. Over 60 million people died from around the world in World War II. Now, this does include those who died in the Holocaust. Over 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust. So, that was one of the calamities of World War II. But over 60 million people died. 3% of the world's population died in World War II. But we've, we came through it. We're still here. We survived it. Okay? We're still kicking. I know these are gory, horrible statistics, but I want you to hear them so you know that God said that he would never allow anything to come upon us that was greater than we could bear. And you know how I know that God knows how much I can bear? Because there have been times in my life when God allowed me to be taken right up to exactly where I thought was my limit. And we kept going and going and going and go. So I know that God knows how much I can take because he took me way past what I thought I could take and we kept going. So God knows what we can take. God knows. God knows. And he said he will never allow us to go through more than we're able to bear. And I want you to remember that. Remember that God is still on the throne. God is still in charge. And God did not create the coronavirus. The devil did. Satan is wanting to take us out, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, in every way. Satan is wanting to take us out. And some people are giving up before they reach the coastline. Because they say the fog is too thick. I can't see the goal. I cannot see the finish line. So I want to give up. You know, a Vietnam War started in, think about this, started in November of 1955. November of 1955, Vietnam War started. I had no idea until I looked it up that it was that long ago. November 1955, and it went from then until April 1975. So just under 20 years that the Vietnam War lasted. And in that war, 58,220 Americans died in the Vietnam War. But when you think of all these things that we've been through, these are horrible, horrible calamities, wars and sicknesses, diseases that have ravaged our world. And we're still here. We're still alive. 
We're still surviving and even thriving in spite of what we've been through in the past. I want you to listen to these words from uh, one of my heroes in the Bible, one of my greatest heroes in the Bible, the Apostle Paul. Talks about him in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 17, it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And then down in verse 22, it says, when, he, when they had met with the elders, he says, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But... None of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. Think of these words. I mean, this is why Paul is such a hero of mine is because of his attitude in the face of persecution. He said, everywhere I'm going, there are people coming up to me saying, God has shown me in a vision, in a dream. God has given me a prophetic word for you saying that where you're headed, they're going to put chains on you and you're going to be persecuted. And Paul said, even though I'm faced with chains, persecution, and imprisonment. And even later in this chapter, he went on to tell these people, he said, I know this is the last time I'm going to see you face to face. I'll never see you again face to face. This is it. He said, but none of these things move me. None of these things make me think about quitting, about giving up. There are people who are sequestered in their homes throughout America right now that some of them are thinking of giving up. That this is the end. This is the finish line. See, Paul said, I'm going to finish my race. I'm going to finish this thing. And I want to say to you, you and I need to have that attitude of saying, I'm going to finish. I'm not going to let this stop me. I'm not going to allow this or anything else to cause me to give up before I reach the finish line. And what's happening right now is some people are moving the finish line. They're moving it forward, say, saying, I, I'm going to move it right to where I am right now. This is it. It's over. You need to remember that God says in Jeremiah 29, 11, my favorite scripture in the Bible, in the New International Version, it says, for I already know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. They are plans to prosper you and not to harm you, to give you hope and a future. That's what God says to us, is that God already knows the plans he has for us. Think about that. When God says he already knows the plans he has for us, that means he saw in advance everything that was going to happen. This coronavirus may have shocked all of us, but God didn't even raise an eyebrow. He was not surprised at all. He didn't even go, really? God knew this was coming. It was not a surprise to God. And what I'm saying to you is that before all of this, knowing about the coronavirus, knowing about the AIDS epidemic, knowing about all the wars that were going to happen, knowing about the Spanish flu that came uh, like over 102 years ago, 
knowing all of those things, God said, I already know the plans I have for you. And they are plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse number 10, one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Now, let me ask you, why didn't it say the happiness of the Lord is your strength? Let me tell you why. Because happiness is based on what is happening. Happiness is about what's happening right now. So, I'll be honest with you, we're not happy about what's going on right now. But many of us still have joy. What's the difference? Joy is not about what's happening right now. Joy is about where I'm headed. It's about my destination, the finish line, the coastline to Florence Chadwick. The finish line, the, 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 the end of my race. That's what joy is about, is about where I'm headed. That's why God told us about heaven in advance, was so that we could have joy in knowing where we're going. We may not always be happy about what's happening around us at this exact moment, but the joy of knowing our final destination can give us the strength to keep going. Have you ever seen people that draw their strength from happiness? They're happy one day, sad the next, then happy the next, then sad the next, then happy the next, then sad the next. Their happiness comes and goes. And if, they're, if you're drawing your strength from happiness, right now, you're not strong. You don't have any strength because you're not happy about what's going on. But if you draw your strength from joy, then you can take heart and say, even though I may not be happy about what's going on, I have joy in knowing my destination hasn't changed. See, the only reason that you should lose joy is if you change your destination. But if your destination is still the same, then your joy is still the same, which means if you draw your strength from joy, your strength is still there. You're just as strong. You're just as strong because you draw your strength from joy. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number two about Jesus Christ, it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now, endurance is not about happiness. Endurance means you're going through something that's testing you. You're going through something that is stretching you, that might make you even think about giving up. If, if you're drawing your strength from happiness, you might give up right there. But it says, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I heard a story many years ago about a, a man who was very wealthy. I've heard it was a, a true story about a, a, one of the wealthiest men in America. I won't say his name, but anyway, this man owned several corporations and uh, he had a, a lot of money coming in from, from oil 
production, oil drilling throughout the United States. And, and, and one day he, he had this fear. It's the same fear that all wealthy people have. And that was he feared that his wealth that he had amassed and the things that wealth bought for his family, the privilege, the comforts, would possibly weaken his sons, that they would not learn a great work ethic since everything was literally handed to them on a silver platter. So one day, he called his sons in and he sat them down in the boardroom of his giant corporation in New York City on the top floor of the big, massive uh, uh, office building that they owned in New York City. And he sits them down at that, that boardroom table, that big, long, expensive mahogany table that had all of these brass engraved nameplates for each of the the board members for that corporation and as he sat there with his sons he said listen we're going to do a little experiment guys and he said he said nobody's ever told me about this experiment he said i decided i wanted to do this with the two of you he said so here's what it is he said starting today your names are going to be changed. You'll keep the same first name, but your last name is going to be changed. Nobody is going to know that you're related to me. And what we're going to do is that I'm going to send you down to the oil fields in West Texas. He said, you're not going there as supervisors or as managers of the project, or even as foremen, he said, instead, you're going there as the bottom, li- bottom guys on the rung of the ladder. You're going there as basically the grunts, to do the grunt work. People we refer to as roustabouts. And basically, they do whatever they're told to do. They don't have specific jobs. They just do whatever you tell them to do on the oil rig. And he said, you're going to go down there and you're going to do that for the next year. And he said, if you can do that for one year without telling anybody your real last name, without telling anyone that you're my son, and keep your identity hidden, and do this work for the next year, then I'm going to fly you back here to New York, and you'll have brass nameplates engraved on this boardroom conference table. And he said, you will sit on this board with me, helping me run our conglomerate of so many corporations around the world. You will help me to run this business empire. And one day you will inherit it from me when I die. He said, but if you tell anybody your name and who you are in the next year, you will lose your entire inheritance. You'll lose it all. So I guess that's a pretty good motivator for them not to tell anybody their last name. Well, when he sent them down there, he told them, he said, listen, you're going to be doing the grunt work. And he said, you're going to be living in a bunkhouse with all these sweaty, smelly, stinky men who have been working for 12 hours or more in a day. They're going to be exhausted, snoring, everything. He said, you're going to eat in the same dining room with them, just eat the same grub that we give to all of them. He said, you're not going to have all of this fine cuisine from these chefs that we have working for us in our different homes and mansions and being served by by our uh, maids and butlers. You're not going to have all of that. You're going to eat the same stuff they eat. You're going to sleep where they sleep. You're going to bathe where they bathe. You're, you're just going to have a, just a, a, a normal life with these guys and never tell a one of them who you are. Well, when they went down there, the, the, one of them 
was miserable. Why? Because he was drawing his strength from happiness. And since he wasn't happy, he let everybody know it. Now, he couldn't tell him his last name, but he let everybody know, I don't like this. This is awful. I don't want to do this. I shouldn't have to do this. If you only knew who I was, you would know. And the foreman was like, hey, I don't give a rip who you are, son. You're going to do this work. You're going to do what I tell you to do. Well, the other one was the exact opposite. <laughs> he thought He thought it was like an adventure. It was like an adventure to him, man. I mean, he, he was like, every day was exciting to him, seeing what he was going to have to do next. And he laughed through the whole year. He laughed. Through the whole, in fact, he even kept a journal to record everything, wrote down everything that happened to him in that year because he thought of it as an adventure. Why? Because he saw the finish line and he drew his strength from that joy the other brother was miserable why because he was drawing his strength from happiness and since he wasn't happy neither one of them were happy being there but one of them was still strong because he had joy because he saw where he was headed, not just where he was at that moment. And you and I need to be the same way. See, some people, when they see me, they think that I'm a little wacko because I smile so much and because I show so much joy. They don't understand. I may not be happy with the way things are in the world. May not have been happy last year. May not have been happy the year before at all times. But I have the joy of knowing where I'm headed. And as long as my destination hasn't changed, my joy is still there. And I can draw my strength from that joy. Jesus, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says that he prayed until his sweat became as great drops of blood. What does that mean? That means that scientists and, and doctors tell us that's a condition where the, the stress, the emotional stress, is so overwhelming that the entire surface of your skin in your body all the surface of your skin becomes as if you had third degree burns so that if anyone touches you anywhere on your skin blood comes out because you're so stressed does that sound like he was happy no he wasn't happy he even said father if there's any other way let this cup pass from me i don't want to do this but did he do it? Yeah, he went through with it. Went through the whole thing. Why? For the joy that was set before him. Because he could close his eyes and envision you and me coming to Jesus Christ and accepting him as our Savior and us being set free from sin, us being forgiven, and our destination being changed for eternity. And so that joy gave him the strength he needed to go through the cross. He endured the cross because he had joy. The joy gave him the strength. I want to give you a message that I preached based on the life of the youngest king that Israel ever had, Josiah, who became king at age eight. When he was 18 years old, he turned an entire nation to God. In fact, after his death, God said that no king 
before or after him had ever sought after God like he did. What caused this young man to be transformed into such a mighty man of God? He learned his destiny. I want you to have this message so you will be inspired to find God's destiny for your life. If you'd like to get this free audio CD or download it now as an MP3 file, just visit our website, markgorman.com. And on the homepage, click the link for the free audio.